from Two Keto LLC. It's Keto Woman Podcast with Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto Lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. Keto has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again, without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. (laughs) Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women may be the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we can't offer you medical advice. It's always best to work with your own doctor because they know you and have access to the bigger picture. This week's extraordinary woman is Carolina Cartier. Carolina was diagnosed with precocious puberty at only three years old and then PCOS at 13. Her weight climbed to 380 pounds, that's 172 kilograms, at its highest point. Working as a financial analyst, she was constantly tired, foggy-headed, short-tempered, and just downright miserable. She discovered the ketogenic diet in 2014 and lost 120 pounds, 54 kilograms, over two years. Even more surprising, after 19 years of no ovulation or cycles due to PCOS, she started cycling after only four months on keto. She is currently pregnant with spontaneous twin boys. Welcome, Carolina, to the Keto Women podcast. How are you today? I'm wonderful. Thank you. How are you doing? It's really good to have you here. I'm good. Thank you. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. I live in the greater Seattle area. And I am a former financial analyst who had a lot of health problems, and I've since switched to the nutrition side and am pursuing education and a business on that side of things. So a completely different uh, career path. Brilliant. Real, real change in your life circumstances there. So keto means something different to everyone. What does it mean to you and what does your keto look like? Sure. So keto, it definitely looks different to different people and usually when that question comes up, it's all about macros and what do you eat and what exactly that means. And to me, it's much more about what is your end goal and what is it that you're pursuing. And so for me, keto was a mechanism for me to improve my health, for me to turn things around and specifically fertility and all of my endocrine health and hormone health uh, as just a way to finally live the life you're supposed to live and to be healthy. And so that's what it means to me. As far as what it looks like on a daily basis, that really has changed a lot over the years. And I'm sure we'll get into that uh, a lot more. Um, But at first, you know, when I transferred to keto from what I had been told to eat, which was a very low fat, high grain diet, um, I, I really did feel like I was starving. And so at the very beginning of keto for me, I was very high fat, very low carb, uh, and it's kind of changed over time. And so a lot of what I will talk to people about when we're discussing, you know, what's the right thing for you is what is your goal and where are you now? What are you hoping to achieve? Right. Interesting. Yeah. So You mentioned that you've had health issues for a long time, specifically hormone related. When exactly did that start? Yeah, so it seems odd to start from the beginning, but I I do because my health issues were very severe. And especially if I'm talking to other women, I want them to know that no one's a lost cause, right? So with me, I originally had an endocrine diagnosis of precocious puberty when I was only three years old. And so what that means, we're three, not 30, three, you know, I was a toddler. And what that means is that I was going through various forms of puberty already. So you see things like breast tissue. Um, at and other three forms years of, old. At three. And so it's fairly simple to diagnose. You start looking at hormones, you start seeing signs of puberty. And that's what it is. Precocious puberty is starting very, very early. 
And so the question has always been what causes that? And we know that young girls are starting their periods earlier, maybe at seven or nine instead of 13, 14, which is what we used to see. So I started extremely early. And because of that, I was monitored very closely trying to see what was going to happen to my health. Um, I was given things like anti-growth hormone because I was growing so quickly. I'm six feet tall. Uh, thank goodness I finally stopped growing. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what that is in meters. I think it's 1.8 something uh, for, for listeners and meters. Yeah, sounds right. So... I'm quite tall and that was happening very rapidly. And so I was being monitored by the physicians trying to figure out what was happening. And they kept thinking she's going to start her period anytime. And it just didn't happen, didn't happen. Um, finally, my growth plates closed when I was 12 years old. So I've been, been six feet tall since I was 12. And they said, okay, her growth plates are closed. She's going to start cycling now. It's going to happen. And it still didn't happen. So at the age of 13, I received, finally, we did an ultrasound, and I received the diagnosis of what is now PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. At the time, it was called polycystic ovarian disease. And it's changed a little bit over time of how that's diagnosed and what happens. But so I have had PCOS since then. That would have been the mid 90s, <laughs> mid to late right. 90s that I had that diagnosis. And typically, we see women diagnosed with PCOS in their 20s, usually because they're wanting to have children, and then they're struggling, and then they get this diagnosis. Um, and unfortunately, there's usually been signs going on for 5, 10 years or longer, and nothing was done about it. And so we kind of have reached this point where, okay, you're very unhealthy, how are we going to turn it around? We could have done something earlier to help, but we didn't. So. That is where we are. So that is a bit of my history regarding hormone health, just to show that it can be bad. <laughs> it can start very early, but it can be turned around. And the big reveal for everyone, if they don't know, is that I am currently pregnant, uh, 37 weeks with twins, completely spontaneous, no medication. So it can be turned around. And that's, you know, that's the big reveal of my story is, you know, I was told I could not have children. And I found keto for hormone health. And it worked. It really did. And we see it every day. Uh, you know, how how you and I met was largely through all the women who are conceiving children who struggled with infertility for years, and then it gets completely turned around. So it's keto really is powerful. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the perfect twist to the story, isn't it? The, the perfect yeah. ending that you were looking for. Exactly. I've heard that before with PCOS, that it's discovered probably most frequently when, when people are trying to get pregnant and, mm -hmm. and struggling, and then investigations are done, and, and that's when it's, it's discovered. But it sounds like it's, it's something that's, that would be much better diagnosed earlier what kind of what are the earlier symptoms you know how how can we be aware of this and start to realize um, that potentially this is an issue we might have at an earlier stage so that we can start reversing it much sooner yes so the the most obvious symptom and what usually happens is that a woman will through sometimes teen years or in her 20s have an irregular cycle and it's as simple as that. If you're not cycling on a regular schedule for you, whether that's 28 days or 30 days or what have you, if it's irregular, there's likely something wrong. And our modern medicine simply says, well, we'll stick you on the birth control pill and that should take care of it. And intervening with your cycle hormonally does have a lot of lasting effects that can be damaging for women. And we, we do that. We stick young teens on birth control, and that could be masking the symptoms as well. So um, if you're not on a hormonal birth control pill and you're not having regular cycles, there is likely something going on that needs to be addressed. And we tend to leave it saying, oh, it's not too important. You're not trying to have a baby. But it is important. This is a, a normal uh function of the body that needs to be addressed. And we wouldn't leave other things alone and say, ah, it's okay. Yes, your, your blood pressure is out of control, but 
you know, it doesn't matter right now, we would address it. And so the same thing with your hormone health, if something is wrong, it should be looked at and addressed um, with PCOS. So there's there's a difference between a, a disease and a syndrome. And it with PCOS being changed from disease to syndrome, it's now a little harder to diagnose. And so a syndrome specifically is more of a set of symptoms. And so there could be 20 different symptoms. And if you have some of them, then you get told that you have this syndrome. And so it could be three, four, five of the 20 different symptoms that you have. Like I said, uh, lack of a regular period or amenorrhea is the most common. Um, they could go on to check to see if you're ovulating, to see if you have anovulation, which is no ovulation, or if it's every couple of months. And that's typically diagnosed. You can check hormonally, but typically you would just have an ultrasound. And they can check, look at your ovaries and see what's happening. If you're not ovulating regularly, that's when we see what's called the the polycystic ovary, which is really a bunch of follicles that started to develop, but then didn't fully develop. And so that is probably the second most common. Um, you don't always develop an actual cyst. It's called polycystic ovarian. Uh, you may not develop an actual cyst, but we'll see, okay, your follicles started, but you didn't actually ovulate. So that's probably the second most common. Um, however, a lot of physicians don't test these things. Uh, and I would say the, the complaint that a lot of women would have besides lack of a period would be things like extra facial hair. Right. Yeah. Uh, which happens because you're having higher levels of testosterone, um, and usually higher levels of estrogen as well. And then no progesterone. And that low progesterone is due to lack of ovulation most of the time. Uh, and I wish it could be more concise. You know, with a, with a disease, it's saying, we have these specific factors. There is this exact biological cause. It's a defined group of symptoms. And it's very easy to say, yes, you have this disease or you do not. And with PCOS, it's changed so much over time. And I actually think that that's a detriment to women. And there's there's a book that came out that even said, okay, there's type 1 PCOS and type 2 PCOS. Uh, because we don't have a clear definition of what does it mean. And some women may just have a hormone imbalance, whereas others may have an issue interfering with ovulation. And so my advice is if your periods are in any way irregular, start investigating. Is that why it changed from being called a disease to a syndrome? Because it was quite difficult to, to pin down and be exact about it. Why, why was that, that change in clarification? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure who decided and who made that call to change the name. Um, I, I do think that with our modern food <laughs> and with modern society, a lot of us, men and women, are having changes to our endocrine system, changes to our hormone health. And what has happened is we've just created this large bucket of, okay, something's wrong with you hormonally as a, as a female, something's wrong with your cycle. I'm just going to call it PCOS. And that's my guess is that we've changed it just so it could be more encompassing. So instead of saying you have some sort of idiopathic problem that we're unable to treat, we're going to call it PCOS and treat it all the same. And the treatment for most people, the standard care is metformin, uh, which is because of the insulin component, which I, I didn't go into. And some women have that and some don't. Um, so usually the treatment is metformin and a birth control pill. And they say, if you want to get pregnant, they'll say, come back. We'll take you off birth control and we'll probably use Clomid, which is, you know, to stimulate ovulation. Right. But that's not really a treatment in my book. <laughs> We're not solving the problem. <laughs> so it's not standard then. I certainly was under the impression that insulin resistance and PCOS did always go together, but that's not necessarily so. I, in my opinion, it probably should. So if I were to change PCOS back to a disease where you had defined symptoms, I would say that high levels of insulin probably should be included. Right. Because then we have a specific treatment that we can do. We can say, okay, your high levels of insulin, your hyperinsulinemia is interfering with the normal course of ovulation. And that is, you know, that's the underlying cause that 
prevents you from ovulating, which thus prevents you from having progesterone, which thus prevents you from having a period, which is why you're unable to conceive. So then we have this very clear pattern. And that was very much my case. When we get into my health, you know, once we started investigating my health history and, and, um, this, this podcast is more about PCOS and, and in general, but what I solved with keto was my very high insulin. And we generally say it should be close to five on a level of uh, fasting. Um, fasting insulin should come back at around five on your lab result. I tell people if you can at least get below 10, that's wonderful. Mine was above 70. So it was very, very high. So, wow. um, now what I've learned over the years being in different groups for fertility or PCOS or trying to conceive or all of these different, you know, Facebook groups and talking to other women is that many women are given the diagnosis of PCOS, but they say, I have absolutely normal insulin. They actually have had it tested. Some women are given the diagnosis of PCOS and they ovulate. And so to me, that's very surprising. And again, this goes back to kind of this large bucket that's been created. So they maybe have high testosterone. And so the doctor gave them a diagnosis of PCOS. Um, and I've seen that a lot, especially recently. And it's very surprising to me because in my opinion, if we were to actually treat it and what's the definition, and this comes from my background as well, I would say typical PCOS would be usually high levels of insulin interfering with ovulation, leading to enlarged ovaries, leading to lack of a period. So that is what I would say would have been typical. But as we have all of these different types of food and hormones in our food and hormones in our environment, we're seeing just a lot of different things cropping up. And a lot of women just get put in that PCOS bucket. Um, Mm -hmm. And the issue is your treatment will be different. <laughs> yeah, because there isn't another bucket to put them into, isn't it? Mm-hmm. it? We're obsessed with having to have a label with, for something. And to a certain extent, you do need a label because the label sort of shows you how to treat that problem. I but think it's the, more of a billing code. Honestly, we need a billing code for that appointment, yeah. right? The doctor mm-hmm. has to be able to say, I treated them for this. This is how it's going to be billed. And maybe it's just that there could be another syndrome out there that has yet to be named. I don't know. Uh, there could be another disease out there. Uh, but a lot of women will find that simply taking certain hormone producing foods out of their diet resolves whatever the issue was. Yeah. We'll probably be stuck with this, uh, PCOS bucket until there's another bucket with a, with a different mm-hmm. name for that. S- small population that have been thrown into the PCOS bucket that actually need a new bucket of their own. And I guess we just right. have to wait for things to develop for these new labels to, right. to crop up. And I don't want to say there's, you know, the severe cases and the less severe because they can be just as damaging even if you are ovulating and you're unable to conceive. That's, you know, just as heart wrenching and difficult for you. But it may be that the treatment will take less time and it may be easier to resolve if you're already ovulating. It may be something smaller and just you just need a little tweak. Whereas someone in my case who had anovulation for 16 years from age 13 to 29, I did not have a single period. I did not ovulate even once. And so it was not until I started a ketogenic diet that I started ovulating. And that's weird to say, you know, you know, you're talking to your lady friends. When did you start your period? Oh, 12, 14. Oh, I was nine. How old were you? 29. <laughs> 29 when yeah. I started my period. Uh, which again just goes to show there is no lost cause. You know, it's amazing what changing your diet can do. And that's what it did for me, which led to a now healthy pregnancy and spontaneous twins, you know, to go from never ovulating. And then I ovulated double. So, so there you go. Yeah. And then end up with twins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I th- I'd, I'd like to see young women, girls, really it, it being stressed how important period health is. And so I think 
I mean, I, you know, I can, I can remember what it's like. Periods are just, they're, they're just a nuisance. Then, you know, mm-hmm. they're not something that you're bothered about. You, you know, great. If I'm, if I'm not having them as often in for, for a lot, lot of girls, that's just, you know, that's just handy because they're an absolute pain. But I think to, to have it really explained how important it is for their health, not only in the, in the future for fertility, but, but they're all round health, you know, while, while they're, while they're still young, as they're growing, it, it, it just seems absolutely key to women to, to get their, um, hormonal health as optimal as possible. I would agree wholeheartedly. And it's, it's unfortunate that a lot of the birth control that comes out now prevents a period. The hormonal birth control. We have yeah. things that implant in your arm. We have, um, you know, uterine implants that are hormonal that are meant to stop your period. And it's unfortunate that likely when everyone's so excited, oh, I don't have to have one. They may have been having painful periods. They may have been having clots or other issues. And those are things that should have been addressed. And I hear this from women who had normal cycles, who went keto. All of a sudden, they're saying, wow, my period is actually less painful. It's not such a big problem. You know, it's a normal four days, but it seems, you know, manageable. Whereas before I was knocked out, I couldn't go to work. I was in cramping pain. And so um, knowing that there can be problems and completely stopping your period, whether you're a teen or an adult woman, may not be the best for you long term. And so uh, when people ask me, other women, well, what what birth control would you use? I generally recommend a physical block. Um, Jackie Everstein in the keto world recommends that as well. There are physical blocks for both the woman and a man that they can use as safe and effective birth control that's not going to affect your hormone health long term because you never know. And, you know, whether your plan is to have children or not, interfering with that cycle doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem uh, like the normal course of health to me. And we're finding more and more that hormonal birth control can lead to a lot of other health issues down the line. So we know that some of the immediate things could be severe life-threatening blood clots, for example, um, issues with your blood pressure short term, and long term, we're finding things like cancer that can happen if you're interfering with your cycle hormonally. So, you know, you can go online and look at the long list and they're, they're on the package, they're on the insert. We know that this can happen, Mm -hmm. but we're so desperate to either uh, reduce our cycles or just need an effective form of birth control that we're using these products and we're told that they're safe. Uh, but my, again, just me personally, I say go for the physical block, you know, do what's right for you in the end. But someone who, as someone who has recovered from severe, a severe endocrine disorder, I highly caution <laughs> against preventing what comes naturally. Right. That's it's there for a reason. Yeah. So what are we talking about here? Uh, you know, obviously condoms, but are there are there any other things that can be used? Are there are there forms of the coil, for example, that that are effective and safe? Yeah, there's the copper IUD. So a copper IUD has no hormones in it. It's just physical. Um, right. And so it, it helps um, at the end of the cycle to make sure you will indeed have a period that you will not um, maintain a pregnancy. And so that's one option condoms, diaphragms still exist. You know, I'm not super well versed. I'm pregnant. So I was not <laughs> not attempting to prevent pregnancy. Um, but yeah, if you go to your doctor and say, I'm looking for a physical birth control that is not hormonal in any way, what are my options? There's things coming out all the time. So right. uh, I would look at that because obviously, you know, I, I don't want to say women can't have that as an option. But I also don't want you to suffer some of the side effects of hormonal birth control. So finding the right place that you're getting what you need Mm -hmm. without causing any damage, long-term damage potentially. So that was a long time that, that you didn't have a period. Did you, did you say 16 years? Did you? you Yes, age 13 to 29. Right. 16 years. And so what was the, the, the treatment and the things that, that you tried during that time to get your periods back? So I had this, the pretty much standard of care, which was metformin. 
and I was put on a very high dose. It was 1500 milligrams per day, which was taken as two 750 milligram slow release uh, pills per day, very large. So I was on a high dose of that and they hadn't even diagnosed me with hyperinsulinemia, which is interesting. So what yeah. I had always been told is we, we find that it works. So here's metformin. We don't really know why. We do know why. Um, the purpose of metformin is to help with insulin sensitizing, although it didn't seem to work for me. <laughs> and it has some pretty severe GI symptoms at that dosage. So depending on your, on your dosage level, that is another medicine that has some very dangerous long-term effects. And it says that, especially, you know, for things like the liver, it's, it's changing how you metabolize carbohydrates, uh, which no one ever said, if you eat less carbohydrates, you won't need that. So <laughs> no one mentioned yeah, that. Exactly. That there is another, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's another method. Instead of, you know, eat all this bread yeah. and take this pill, how about just don't eat the bread? So my standard of care was, uh, was metformin and a birth control pill. But as a young teen, um, I was not very good at taking the pills, I'll be honest. Uh, I was not great at that. And especially the birth control. And I stopped because it, it made me really irritable. And even with mm -hmm. that, I think I was on, I don't even know if it's used anymore. Orthotricycline, I believe was the kind at the time. And I'm not well versed on all of the different hormonal um, birth controls anymore. Uh, but that was the kind that I was on. And I still didn't have a period. And that is shocking to me. Right. It's supposed to introduce hormone during, during your cycle. And then you take a placebo for, I think, a week. And that's when you're supposed to have your period. And I still didn't. And that just tells me now that I can go back and understand a little bit more that my hormones were so out of whack, just so in the wrong place that even this hormonal pill couldn't induce a period for me. And it likely was that I just had too many different hormones floating around and, and this small dose pill wasn't making a dent is my guess. Um, so that was really interesting that, you know, even taking that, it wasn't solving the problem. And I know because we went and had ultrasounds throughout my teen years and then also in my 20s. And even taking the pill, I still had polycystic ovaries. Um, they were enlarged. They were, had extra fluid. I had extra follicles. Um, they would just say 20 plus unable to count, meaning that each ovary was so full of underdeveloped follicles that they couldn't even count how many there were. And you think about that, you're, you're having, you know, one a month or one every other month. And this was years mm -hmm. and years that mine had been building up. So, um, yeah. the medication made no, no change for me at all. Um, and I stopped taking it in my twenties because of that. You know, I just said, this is not worth it. I have side effects and symptoms that I don't like, um, might as well reduce that and just live with the symptoms of PCOS. Mm -hmm. I was going to say what, well, you know, when you, when you're going for your checkups and you're having your scans and they're seeing that what you're doing isn't working, it doesn't sound like they they gave you a better alternative. It was just a case of, well, keep taking the pills and maybe miraculously something's going to change. Yes, that is exactly what happened. And I think we know the definition of insanity. And we, you know, we keep doing the same thing. And nothing was changing for me. And it was, well, once you want children, come to us and we'll look at our options. Uh, why can't we look at them now? Yeah. <laughs> I want to be healthy now. <laughs> yeah. So, and I was fortunate. I did eventually stop going to doctors um, because my weight was also out of control. And so I, you know, I always talk about health because to me, that is why I went to keto is that I wanted to be healthy. And yes, I was very overweight. Um, I'm six feet tall at my highest weight. I was around 380 pounds. You'll have to convert that for me. Um, I'm sure it was many, many kilograms. <laughs> uh, so very high. And that is way past morbidly obese, right? Very, a very unhealthy weight. Uh, and I couldn't do anything. And they, the doctors would also put me on these specialty, uh, low calorie diets. So like I said, it was all low fat, 
um, high heart healthy grains, right? We're talking baked chicken, baked fish, you know, lemon only, nothing else. Um, there wasn't even a mention of vegetable. It was just, you know, have that with bread kind of, kind of discussion, but they were reducing my calories quite severely. And I think that that only made my hormone health worse. Uh, I would be put yeah. on a 1200 calorie diet or a 1000 calorie diet. And in my former life, I was a financial analyst. I'm, I'm good with numbers. I'm great with data. Give me an Excel spreadsheet and I'm happy. I was tracking everything and I was not losing weight. So when we're told that weight loss is as simple as a caloric deficit, I scoff <laughs> a bit. I <laughs> laugh at that because I was in a caloric deficit as defined by the medical community per what my energy expenditure should have been. I should have lost weight on a low calorie diet. I did not. I gained weight. So there's a lot to be said for that when we look at keto and, 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 you know, when you ask what does keto mean to you and macros, there are different groups with different philosophies. And I have been told directly by some of these groups that I must have miscalculated. I must have not properly recorded what I was eating because there's absolutely no way that with an increase in calories that I could have lost weight. And when I went keto, I increased my calories. I started eating a lot of fat, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is what my body needed for hormone health. Uh, and I ate very low carb and I ate what I call moderate protein. And the big difference between all these groups, usually everyone says, okay, low carb, about 20 grams or so. Most groups agree with that. The big debate is how much protein to fat you should have. And mm -hmm. that changes. Yeah. And we've even heard on your, your podcast, some, some women say I need reduced plate fat and mm -hmm. higher protein. I needed much higher plate fat. Let me tell you, I needed a lot and I started feeling better immediately. And my, my caloric intake did increase. And so instead of arguing with people about how I recorded it and whatnot, I now just refer them um, to Smash the Fat, which is a website. And his name, I believe, is Sam Feltham, where he did a 21-day, 5,000-calorie experiment. And this is a somewhat yep. lean gentleman. I know that who, one. <laughs> yeah, he increased his calories to 5,000 on a ketogenic diet. And his waist circumference went down. He lost body fat. You can hear his pictures. He recorded it. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to argue. This is what worked for me. And, and my, my hormone health improved. And over time, what I've eaten changed. Now I eat much more intuitively uh, than tracking everything so closely. But I've been ketogenic for over three years now. So for someone starting, perhaps tracking might be the best option. But it just goes to show that it changes. It's not just calories. You know, if you look at his work, you look at examples of people like me who did increase calories and lost weight. Um, you know, we see that. And when I went ketogenic, I had lost a little bit of weight. I was 320 pounds. So that's the picture, you know, that I, I have as my profile picture. I was 320 pounds. I was at a wedding. And literally the next week is when I went ketogenic. And I lost 120 pounds in that time um, mm. over, it was about two years or so that I lost, lost that weight. And that was with a pretty high caloric intake. I definitely was not dieting. And uh, while it, my exact macros changed over time, uh, it stayed ketogenic and I still eat fat. And that works for me. But if you go to a group that says, no, you absolutely cannot eat plate fat, if you're not feeling well and you're not seeing progress over, you know, a month, two months, maybe that's not the right approach for you. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a lot of different things work for different people. That That's the thing. It's different things work for different people. But also, I think specifically for women, different things work for one woman differently at different times of the month. You know, we operate on this cycle. It's not consistent. It's not the same thing every day like it tends to be for the male hormone system. The female hormone system is on a cycle and it changes. So it makes sense that one week you're you, perhaps you're going to 
feel that you need more protein. So eat more protein. Another week, it's going to be all about the fat. And it's a case of just finding what works for you. I say that so often, what works for you. But that really is what it's all about, isn't it? I agree. And it's it's challenging because when you're working with individuals, maybe they, you know, if they're wanting coaching or they're wanting advice, I would say nine out of 10 people want an exact regimen. They want a meal plan to follow. They want exact macros. They want to know exactly what to purchase and what they're going to eat every single meal of every single day. And that's very challenging because that's just not how the human ever would have lived, right? Mm -hmm. It's accessible today because of grocery stores and because of methods of cooking and, and freezing and preparing, but that's just not how we've ever lived in history. And you are exactly right. There are days, I would say, you know, you could say week, you could say by day, sometimes it's by hour, you know, sometimes I'm just really hungry and sometimes I'm less hungry. And it took me, it was about at the two year mark until I started feeling like, wow, I could, I could fast. And that's a whole different topic, right? Therapeutic fasting Mm -hmm. um, is a, a whole different topic. And I, started looking into that because my insulin was still high. So four months into a ketogenic diet, um, this was back in 2014, I started cycling, right? And I had left that out too. Uh, it started pretty quickly. Now it started as a long cycle. I think it was 36, 38 days, but this was the first spontaneous menstrual cycle that I had had. So this was really exciting. And then, you know, it was the next month or so I had another one. I'm tracking everything like, wow, this is happening. Over time, it kept getting shorter and shorter until I got to a perfect 28 day cycle, which is, you know, textbook. And this happened. Um, and so I was very excited, but my insulin was still high. I still wasn't pregnant, which was what I was hoping. And so I kind of, you know, no doctor today would ever tell me at that point that I had PCOS because we checked my hormone levels and estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, uh, all normal. Um, my ovaries were shrinking rapidly down to completely normal size. Um, all of my symptoms of PCOS had disappeared, right? So no new doctor, if I didn't give them my history, would have said, oh, yes, you have PCOS. And yet I wasn't conceiving. So when we talk about those different buckets, you know, it's like I probably would not have been diagnosed at that time. And yet I was in that infertile area where, you know, a year goes by, I have normal cycles, and I'm still unable to conceive. So I focused on something I could focus on, which was, okay, my weight's already down but my insulin is still high. So I'm going to look at ways that I can reduce my insulin. And so I started looking at uh, the work of Jason Fung, Dr. Jason Fung, Mm -hmm. as we know and love um, about fasting. And that came down to a mental game. I realized that I'm not going to go back to my old ways of starving myself, which was what, you know, prescribed starvation from the doctors of my caloric, requirements where they said, you know, a 1000 or 1200. And that's not very much for someone who's six feet tall, let me tell you. Um, and so I refused to go back to forced starvation. But as I read his work and his science and research, I realized that it is normal and natural to have periods of fasting and feasting. And I thought, okay, I might start trying this. And I had dabbled a little bit with Uh, intermittent fasting simply because I wasn't hungry for breakfast. So I might have skipped breakfast, but I hadn't looked into anything longer. And so uh, I just started thinking, you know, I'm really going to pay attention to my hunger signals. And I'm going to see if I'm really truly hungry when it's lunchtime. And if I'm not, if I'm eating because I like to eat, or I'm just eating, you know, because the clock says it's time to eat. Mm, it's but, lunchtime, yeah. Right, it's lunchtime. Um, if I'm not hungry, then I'm not going to eat. And over time, it took a little while, but over time, I started skipping more meals. But I would feast when it was time. To, like, dinner would come around and be like, oh, now I'm hungry. Now I'm going to eat, you know, over 2,000 calories at dinner. Mm-hmm. And I would do that, and I immediately saw results in my insulin levels going down. It was pretty, pretty quick. 
And I, at the time I was working with a naturopathic doctor. So I had left kind of more allopathic MD medicine. She was more in the natural side, naturopathic medicine. Um, and so she was happy to test whatever I wanted tested um, anytime. And so we saw my insulin dropping pretty rapidly. And so I got to the point where 24 hours or 36 hours became normal to me to fast. And, you know, I could eat one meal a day, one large meal a day and feel fantastic. Now, that is not something that I would have enjoyed at the beginning. And I don't think that would have benefited me at the beginning when I was first transferring to the new diet with with very uh, unhappy hormones. I would not recommend not eating anything. Um, But later, as time went on, it became something that felt natural and it felt beneficial. And I saw the results pretty quickly. And so um, I do, I, I've been meaning to email Dr. Fung because <laughs> I went to a conference where he uh, presented, it was low carb Breckenridge. And that was February of this right, year yeah. of 2017. Mm-hmm. And I asked him, and I said, my insulin's still not coming down enough. It's still, it's pretty good. I think at the time it was 7.6. So almost below five. I mean, almost perfect of what he recommends. He said, but I'm still struggling and I'm doing 24 hour fast. I've done occasional three day fasts. And I was very unhappy with his response, which was to fast more. And I thought, well, wait, I'm already <laughs> doing it. It's not working. That's <laughs> how so much more. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, come on now, doc. So I decided I was going to try it and prove that that was not the solution. There had to be something else going on. And I was going to record everything. So I did my first five day fast and it just so happened that I ended up conceiving my twins on that five day fast. <laughs> so, so there you go. I have to email. I attribute that to Dr. Fung. Um, I, I have not emailed him that, but I've told other people that that happened and how funny. I can't fully explain why I have some theories regarding growth hormone, but, uh, it did work and he was right. So, uh, you know, but that was a progression over time. Yeah. Wait for the photo of the twins and, and mm-hmm. email him with that. Be like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting about the insulin. Presumably it came down a, a bit on keto, but just not enough. Or did it did it not come down at all? So it had reduced, that was me being picky. So it had reduced <laughs> quite a bit. So again, when I started, I was over 70, which is severely high. And I have a picture of that um, showing the lab result that my A1C, I believe was a five, which is considered normal, minimal. Mm-hmm. Um, my uh, fasting just glucose for the morning, which we do in milligrams um, per deciliter, I believe, um, was 90, which again, pretty normal. I was never diagnosed with diabetes. And or pre-diabetic even. But then there's my insulin at 70. It's a big red box. Like, oh my gosh, really (laughs) high. And so it came down dramatically over time. And what was interesting is that in uh, November or December of 2016, I had a, a blood test and my insulin was at 14. And then in February, because at this point I had just started a couple months earlier, really trying to get into fasting and listening to my body. And so the end of 2016, my insulin was at 14. By February, just a four or five months later, uh, it was already down to 7.6. So it dropped a lot in those four months, wow. faster yeah. than I'd ever seen it drop. And again, getting below 10, I would say is fantastic for insulin. Um, Dr. Fung likes it below five. And and at that point in time, I was like, well, I'm nearly at my goal weight. Um, everything's fantastic. This is really the only thing I can find, quote unquote, wrong, or something that I can fix and control. So I'm going to focus on getting my insulin lower. And so even in February, when I went to him and said, it's still slightly elevated, I I know it's dropping rapidly, but why is it not perfect after all these years why is it not perfect and he said fast more 
I was so disappointed. Yep. I remember <laughs> going back and talking to all the, the friends I had there. And I'm like, that is not the response I expected. I thought he would, you know, <laughs> at this point, I have so many years of experience, you know, it should be lower. Um, but it was true. It just needed more time. And some of us do. I mean, my, I was two and a half years into keto when I conceived my twins, you know, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And again, I was a pretty severe case. And it's very, I feel for these women in, in the groups that we go into, they are like me. They have been trying to conceive or fix their hormones for maybe five or 10 years. And then four months into keto, they're like, why am I not pregnant yet? <laughs> and I realize that we want it to be instantaneous, but it, it, it isn't. It is kind of that miracle worker. I do occasionally feel like keto is a panacea for all health issues. Uh, but it does take time. The body is healing. It's not a magic pill. It's providing the environment so that your body can heal itself. And that takes time. And I just wish that the medical community <laughs> had given these women the tool earlier. Because at this point, you're saying, I've been waiting for five years already. I don't want to wait any longer. And, and you just have to say, I know it's frustrating. I wish you had started this two years ago, because then by now, you may already have your, your little baby. So I wish that that were the case. For me, it took several years. And I am now, you know, I started keto when I was 29. I am now 32 and having my first children, which is not extremely late in life. But for someone who wanted children, for many, many years, it was hard. You know, I had that 10 year wait mm -hmm. of will I ever, will I ever have a, a, a child? And that was very difficult. Um, and I do wish that I had known about keto before, but at the same time, it did provide me this perspective and understanding of, of what women are going through and what so many of us have been through. And it's, it's always one of those things. If you hadn't gone through the journey, and you hadn't gone through the the trouble, then you never would have realized how wonderful things could be later. And so it's that double edged sword. But now everything is perfect. So I get to just be happy and say, look at look at the power yeah. of changing your diet, something so simple, that is so often overlooked. Yeah, it's so simple. I mean, it, it sounds really like you I know it's frustrating when you want things to happen, but considering you had 16 years with, with no period to then change your diet, change your lifestyle. And, and within three years, you know, you're, you're pregnant with twins that actually in the grand scheme of things sounds like a very fast recovery, but I can, I can imagine in the moment. <laughs> right. As a case study, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. It's like, okay, no, this was fantastic. And, and yes, so it's like, wow, look how it can be turned around. Um, so, and that's why I, I try to go back to the beginning too and just say, look, this was so, so bad. And I was basically told there wasn't going to be any hope. And I was told before Clomid was so popularly used and so ubiquitous, um, I was told as a young teen that I probably couldn't have children which I'm now shocked that they even told me that, you know, it's like that was a pretty big deal. And I don't think I understood it at the time when you're 13, 14, what that really means. But as you get closer to your twenties and you get married and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I was told this wasn't possible. Then it becomes mm -hmm. a different situation. That's typically how it comes about, right? Women are saying, well, now I want to have my family. We're married. We're ready. What do I do now? And that's when the multi-year process starts. I want to make it clear. I'm not against Clomid um, or other, you know, IVF or other fertility treatments to assist you in having a baby. There are many beautiful, happy families that have come about from that form of medicine and fertility treatment. My criticism is that tragically, they very often fail. There's a high failure rate. Mm -hmm. Um, of just being able to conceive. So you may go through a round of IVF or a round of Clomid and not conceive. And there are limits and there are financial constraints to those. Um, and then very sadly, often a woman will conceive, but not be able to carry to term. And that can just be 
because her body wasn't prepared. We did not fix the underlying issue. And we can try our best with hormones. Um, and for those it has worked for, it's been such a blessing. But for those who have had to go through all the heartbreak and say, you know, we spent $100,000 on IVF and we didn't get our, our miracle baby. And that's just so tragic. So I'm not against them mm-hmm. and in any way. And I don't want to make it seem like it's, it's sometimes I'll say, well, you think it's cheating? You think it's wrong? Absolutely not. I just knew it wasn't right for me. And given my very poor luck <laughs> with health, I knew it wasn't something I a road I wanted to go down. I wanted to see if I could fix it naturally. And when I started cycling four months into keto, I realized that I'm onto something here. Like the, this is, yeah. this is in my opinion, we're not allowed to use the C word, right? We're not allowed to say anything's ever cured. <laughs> um, but you can say remission. <laughs> you could say functionally cured. You could say that I could go to a doctor today and would never be diagnosed with PCOS. They would never know mm-hmm. that had happened. So, um, that if you can, if you can turn it around without spending all that money, then why not? You know, to me, it was an easy choice. <laughs> yeah. But it, if you are going to go down that route and real financial commitment and, but also, I mean, the, the physical commitment, I think it's quite a grueling process, isn't it? Yes. There's a, a you know, pre-treatment process that's very, uh, very difficult for women with hormones and prepping and egg harvesting if you're doing IVF and all these things. Yeah. Yeah. But if, if you're going to do that, and that's the decision you've made. But if you change your nutrition and your diet alongside it, then surely it's it's going to give it that much better chance of succeeding. Exactly. And uh, that is, I don't often say you have to talk to your doctor about nutritional changes. However, in the case of something like IVF, I would definitely discuss it. And likely you're going to want to... Uh, to make changes before you start that process so that we're looking at some hormone balancing beforehand. There's a doctor whose name I've forgotten, but he, uh, I was interviewed on diet doctor about pregnancy and keto. And he was quoted in that article as well. And his, I've just forgotten his name, but he is, uh, a fertility specialist physician who uses keto with his clients. And so, you know, there's a prime example where he's seen that you have better results if we're already working on hormone health. Mm -hmm. Now I would say, let's do the hormone, you know, let's fix the diet for a while first if we can, but you know, for women who are in a time crunch and want, are wanting a child this year, um, sometimes the combination is what works best. Yeah, I yeah I remember that article actually, and we'll mm-hmm. we'll put a link to that in in the show notes so so people can go and read that. Um, but who was it who told you about keto in the first place? Or was was it the naturopath you saw, or was it your own research? Yes. Yeah, so funny story, and and just the other day I had a Facebook flashback, and I, I shared it and showed you. Uh, it was 2012 and I, I made a post on Facebook, uh, about, you know, has anyone else heard about this butter coffee trend? And I thought, uh, that yes, was- I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was years before I actually went keto. I had started learning about it. Um, and so in what year was that? It would have been around 2011. I started becoming interested in fixing my health. And I don't know what prompted it. I just decided, you know, I'm overweight. I'm unhappy. I'm, uh, you know, not having any any good results. I was very stressed. I was not happy at work. Like I said, I've changed careers since then. Just so many things were not going the way I wanted them to in my life. So I decided I'm going to start changing. And I started listening to a podcast actually about by Sean Croxton. Um, and it was all about just health in general. And that's when I first learned about things like just going gluten free. So fast forward, I actually adopted a Weston A. Price style of eating, which is similar to paleo. And anyone who's out there who's hardcore, you know, they're going to say, Oh, no, they, they kind of fight a little bit, actually, which I think is funny. Because I think the two groups are very similar. So, uh, and Weston A. Price and paleo are both specifically about food quality. So grass-fed meats, um, 
Paleo, I think, eliminates all grains, whereas Weston A. Price has you ferment them and soak them and sprout them and all of these things. So uh, it's all about food quality in both of these groups. So I made that switch. I went from eating just kind of whatever I was eating, (laughs) as long as it was within my caloric, you know, limit, as per the doctors, um, to switching to very high food quality. And I felt so much better, but I wasn't losing any weight. Right. And that was interesting. I actually had less brain fog. I felt better about the meat that I was consuming, but I wasn't seeing results. So shortly after that, I went to the naturopathic doctor and I said, you know, I'm done with regular who just keep prescribing me things. It's not working. So I went to a naturopath and we were working together and she mentioned, you know, let's go completely wheat free at the time. Like, you know, gluten causes a lot of problems and she focused a lot on GI work. So that was, you know, the next step was, okay, let's just get gluten out of the diet. So, okay, we're making sure. And what's any price for the most part is gluten free as well. Usually you can have rice, but that's the thing I was having following the principles of food quality in either of these groups. You can have as much honey as you want, Mm -hmm. as much sugar as you want. There's no limit to how much honey or molasses, as long as it's not, you know, GMO sugar beet, you can have as much sugar as you want. And that's what was happening. I was like, I'm just going to keep eating desserts. This is great. I'm on a new eating plan. Um, And I wasn't losing weight in that with that plan. So I was working with a naturopath and over time, I still, I was having some progress, but not enough. So what eventually happened in 2014 um, was that I ended up going on disability leave. And my health became so severe that I was put on disability for six months from my job. And this is working in finance. And she said to me, and and she had filled out all the paperwork and helped me and got this all done because my health was just not improving. And actually, she prescribed me HCG. So if you've heard of this, um, it actually is, it's a hormone and it seems weird. And I was very skeptical. Um, but this is how I heard about ketones and what they are. Um, and so with HCG, what happens is you're injecting this hormone, which is a pregnancy hormone that suppresses appetite. Right. And its actual labeled use is usually for pituitary issues. But what happened is it became kind of this diet fad. And there's a big difference between what you would just buy online versus a prescription. By the way, I just want to make that really clear. Like buying some weird pills online scares me. Um, but so she gave me this injection prescription. Yeah. And it was a, fi- it's supposed to be a 500 calorie diet. And I'm saying, well, of course, you know, I'm going to starve myself. Of course, I'm going to lose weight. Like, this is ridiculous. So I was very, very skeptical. Um, but what it includes is very low carb. And that's right. the piece that stuck out to me. And she gave me the urine ketone strips. And this is what started it all. She gave me the package of urine ketone strips. And I said, what's a ketone? And then I went down the rabbit hole. And that's when I realized, Uh wait a minute, I I, like, how, what is this thing? So I started researching and I said, I don't need to do HCG. I did do a round of it and I actually felt really good. Mm -hmm. I realized I don't need to do this. I'm introducing an an external hormone. And as I start reading online, I'm like, you can have ketones without doing this, without starving yourself. And I said, and I don't, even though I did lose a lot of weight, I really wasn't happy with what you were eating on that diet. (laughs) And so I completely switched and said, I'm going to follow a ketogenic diet. And it started it all. It's such a weird place to start. And it's one of those things where again, I'm not against HCG, but it just seems unnatural, like to, Mm -hmm. to be injecting yourself and then restricting what you're eating to such a low amount um, where I was really hungry. It was not easy. I was hungry. Um, some days less, less so some days I felt full. And I think it was just this very crash, get into ketosis in three weeks kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But looking back, I probably had all that keto flu, which is just, you know, electrolyte imbalance and all these things that made it more difficult. So that is how I found keto was through her giving me these ketone strips. And what a weird, to me, it seems so bizarre that that's how I would do it. Whereas now, you know, years later, that was 
what was that 2014 so years later we're going into 2018 it's all over the place right we've got i mean diet doctor is huge um so is rule.me there's so many different blogs out there with recipes and books and mm -hmm. all of these things out there where it's pretty easy you go into costco you're going to see the keto diet book just hanging out on a costco shelf right yeah so it's pretty easy to get introduced to it now but then it wasn't and it was this brand new like what is ketosis kind of Thing. And, and it wasn't new. We know that a ketogenic diet has been around since the 30s and, you know, as far as therapeutically. Um, mm -hmm. But that's how that's how I found out about it. And so I just started researching and bumbled through. All right, I'm going to go low carb. I don't really know exactly what that means. Um, I did look at Diet Doctor for kind of a general guide. And I don't even think they have a macro calculator. I didn't have one specifically. Um, I did look at, I think, Doc Nally's website, and he had some information there, you know, so kind of just fumbled through as far as what I'm eating. And I said, all right, I'm going to track it. And I'm just going to see what happens. And the results were immediate. And that definitely mm -hmm. kept me motivated. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. It well, it impacted in, in so many ways, not only losing the weight, but um, starting your periods and, and improving mm -hmm. uh, your mental clarity. Mm -hmm. Big changes. and But big changes, that's, that's had a knock-on effect to, to the rest of your life, hasn't it? And to your professional life. It has. So, I... So just before I went on uh, disability leave, I graduated with an MBA from the University of Washington here in Seattle. And I was expecting to fully continue on in finance and use that new degree that I had and, and do all those things. Then I went on disability and I had to really realize that I was not in the right place for me. It's long hours. It's, you know, finance is difficult work. Um, and I had worked in New York at an investment bank before that as well. And so before mm -hmm. I came back to Seattle. And so that has all changed. And I was recently accepted to Bastyr University to get a master's in nutrition. Right. And uh, so that was supposed to start a couple months ago. I deferred for a year due to pregnancy. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, well, why on earth would you do that? <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so I will be starting in fall 2018 now instead of, uh, this year. Uh, Cause I, I, over the time that I've been doing keto and losing weight and all of these things, I took all of the prerequisites and realized that I need a different career path, something that really means something to me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going down this path. My goal is to actually continue on to a PhD. So right. I am hoping that will happen. Now, over this very long process, I realized that I, I would like some sort of fulfilling career outside of just going to school, um, you know, have something and, and help other women, other people. But I, my heart really does fall to women who are struggling with fertility because I have been there. And so just before I conceived, uh, I started a business this year called Reva Wellness. And I have a website, RevoWellness.com. And the idea was to provide coaching on a ketogenic diet, how to execute that. Um, and I originally was planning just to see people in person and quickly learned that it was going to be not only easier for me, but also that others wanted more online coaching. So using mm -hmm. video chat or those kinds of things or by phone. So it's kind of evolved over time. And then with the pregnancy, I thought, well, how am I going to keep this accessible and create something meaningful for other women? So I have coming out in 2018, the plan is a fertility boot camp of sorts. It doesn't have an exact name yet. That will be regarding fertility and PCOS. And it's, it's not fully flushed out, but I'm looking at things like uh, recommended lab tests before um, before you're doing dietary changes to help properly diagnose where your hormones are, um, how to execute a ketogenic diet specifically for hormone balance. So while you will likely lose weight on keto regardless, what is your goal here? Yeah. If your goal is hormone balance, going 
too low of fat may not be the right choice in the short term. So looking at the different Mm -hmm. things that have worked, and I just have experience and many, many anecdotes collected of what tends to work um, when you're trying to specifically address hormones versus weight loss. Uh, Recommended supplements and things that can help. Um, to help kind of kickstart that and just over the counter things, you know, I can't prescribe, I'm not a doctor, right? But um, just recommendations, and then how to properly track your cycle or start a cycle. A lot of women like me didn't have one. And so what are either some of the supplements, things like uh, lunaception or tracking, you know, there's a lot of confusion around, am I ovulating or not? So how to track that at home. And then probably some, you know, weekly Q&A sessions around that, like troubleshooting and all of those things. So just kind of a fast track on how to get your fertility revved up, how to get that going, because it's such a common problem. And that's, you know, where I am, my niche and where I'm I'm talking to different women, that's the problem they're facing. And so I'm trying to get that program together so that in 2018, we have something somewhat regimented. And while it will be different for different women, at least we're not just grasping at straws and how do I do this? Uh, I can kind of put together my experience combined with other women and and hopefully, uh, you know, have something in place that'll give us more of a guide. So that's the plan for 2018. Very, very different, let me tell you, than investment banking and mutual funds. Uh, But it's something that means, (laughs) means a lot to me. Um, I've had great success and I just want other women to have that. You know, you see the joy and excitement of overcoming fertility issues. And it's, it's for a lot of us, it is kind of the bane of your existence. It becomes all consuming, something that you think about every day and it's very overwhelming. And so reducing some of that stress Mm -hmm. can only help. And, you know, finally having a solution saying, I'm not going to do this by taking a pill that doesn't seem to be doing anything, but I'd like to actually see some results. And so that's the plan coming soon to 2018. (laughs) It sounds perfect. It sounds like a really good package that includes um, a practical toolkit, like you say, all the the different things for tracking and Mm -hmm. identifying actually the individual problems that you have. And then alongside that, some articles and advice and plans to follow then the more individualistic side of it with the with the Q&A your experience so the the person that these people will be dealing with is somebody who's been through it themselves mm-hmm. which which always helps and it it sounds fantastic and you know with all that this is this is something you're passionate about it's something that means a lot to you and it's helping women out there who very much need it it's you know this this is a service that that lots of people really desperately need so it sounds like a fantastic plan and i wish you all the best with it 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 sounds like you're going to have an extremely busy <laughs> next couple of years <laughs> you've not only got twins coming (laughs) you're going back to school setting up a new business I mean you know wow (laughs) good luck with all of that it's a lot I have a very supportive partner thank goodness (laughs) who who (laughs) has been fantastic uh you know through all of it and helping me get things going and you know he saw the change I make a joke to a lot of people so when I first went on keto And people say, well, how do you know it was working before your period started? And I said, well, because about four weeks in, four to six weeks in, my husband says to me, you yell a lot less. (laughs) (laughs) I realized, wow, you know, you're right. I am a lot happier. And it didn't take very long to start seeing those changes. And not only was I happier, I think it was largely hormonal shifts happening. Um, (laughs) But you know, I wasn't hangry, I wasn't starving, I was just better with life, you know, everything started turning around. And uh, I just use that quote from him, because it's so true. Absolutely. (laughs) And who wouldn't want that, right? Who wouldn't want to be happier and have their friends and family being like, wow, like you've, you've really turned a corner. (laughs) Yeah, we like you more now. (laughs) We like the new you. (laughs) 
Well, it, it's been absolutely fascinating um, talking to you today. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Perhaps we could end up with your top tip for the listeners. Yes. So we discussed this and I, I wish I knew whom to attribute the quote, but there's a, a quote that I love and I use it all the time. And it states, uh, a year from now, you'll wish you had started today. That's brilliant. <laughs> and I absolutely love that mentality, whether we're talking diet or treatments or anything in life. Um, starting now is always going to be beneficial. Just try, just start. Uh, you may fumble through whatever it is, but especially with keto, there's not going to be a detriment to giving it a go and learning something now. Um, and, you know, again, if I had learned about keto in my teenage years, I probably would not have struggled so severely. And so give it a go. Start now. You won't regret it. Brilliant. I, th I think that's fantastic. And I often use a, a similar thing to say to people, but sort of coming from the other direction. When people are struggling in the moment when they're talking about stalls in weight loss, for example, or things aren't going as they planned or as they hoped, I say to them, just pull back out and think of the bigger picture and just imagine what it's going to be like a year from now if you keep chipping away as you are now. And that's what I used to say to myself when I was getting frustrated um, with my weight loss or lack of it. I just thought, well, well, just keep going because this last year has gone really quickly. So this year coming will go really quickly. And, and just imagine where where you're going to be a year from now. So I yeah, I think it's great. That it's makes me a, think of a, a good second to be. tip would be then to take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I wish I'd done that. I'm I'm so disorganized. I I certainly planned to from the start. I was going to take pictures every month in the mm -hmm. same clothes and you know and it was it was going to look great. No, I managed to take yeah, about two. Yeah, because when you're saying that when you take back like, okay, wait, no, I really have made a lot of progress. Um pictures will help. And I don't know anyone who's when they're at their highest weight or a weight they're not comfortable with who wants to pose for a full body picture. You don't have to show anyone. You don't have to do anything. But no, exactly. A year from now, you probably will want to show someone and say, look, this is where I was and look where I am now. So that's my second very practical tip is just take photos, hide them if you have to, yeah. you know, lock them on your phone, but you will be happy to have them once your body has transformed and you realize, wow, look what I've accomplished. Yeah, you really wish you'd taken them. <laughs> I think... Um, Siobhan in, in the Facebook group, she, she posted a fantastic, um, line of pictures the other day, which I think was taken every month mm -hmm. since she'd started keto. And it was, it was fantastic. It just, it just looked so great. I, thought, I wish I'd done that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today, Carolina. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. To get the resources and links from the show, please go to www.ketowomanpodcast.com. Do you want to be one of my extraordinary women? Maybe you've an idea for a show, a topic you want to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. If you fancy joining me on this exciting adventure and help create new shows, head on over to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash ketowoman. Or you can also simply hit the support button on the website. It's thanks to the two keto dudes that I'm hosting this podcast, so please consider heading to their Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com and help them bring you more podcasts like this one. This week, I thought I would share a post from my Facebook KKB group. This comes from Mon, and she wrote the following. Sharing a win. I'm doing a five-day course this week, and we're all bringing our own lunches. Yesterday, I was asked about my eating as my meals stand out from the other garbage. I gave a brief, restrained and respectful account of what keto is and my journey to date. I referred a few folks to the Two Keto Dudes forum who wanted more info, but kept a lid on my proselytizing, which was very, very hard. Today, I got to cut loose with all my passion and excitement for this way of eating because people had done a little research overnight and had heaps of questions for me. 
Their open minds blew me away. I have not encountered that level of interest or open-mindedness from anybody I know. The entire lunch break was taken up with questions and sharing of my knowledge. More than one person told me I should start my own YouTube channel, lol. <laughs> Sounds like you should, Mon. After class, one woman approached me, spoke of her health struggles and wanted to know if I thought keto would help. She got tears in her eyes when I said I knew it would and hugged me, telling me she felt hope and excitement about her health for the first time in years. She now has the number of my keto advocating dietitian and will be starting on her own keto journey. It's just wonderful to be able to have these conversations and to inspire total strangers to start their own journey back to health. P.S. I've also been bringing keto treats in to share every day. I think it opens people's minds when they realise that deliciousness, not deprivation, is standard with keto. And that, I think, is the perfect end quote for today's show. Thank you, Mom, for a great story. Deliciousness, not deprivation, is standard with keto. Bye-bye, keto lovelies.